Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, esteemed guests, to the launch of the Ombudsman for Banking Services 2022 Annual Report. Thank you for joining us on this important occasion, a highlight on the OBS calendar. It is encouraging to see so many people interested in the work of this office. We have prepared an interesting summary of the information contained in our 2022 Annual Report for you, and we trust that you will enjoy our presentation as well as reading the full report afterwards. First on the agenda, I am handing over to the Chair of the Board of Directors, Advocate John Myberg, SC. Welcome everyone to the third remote launch of the 2022 Annual Report of the OBS. The report will become available on the OBS website immediately after this presentation. There are a few matters that I wish to highlight. Firstly, Despite the ever-changing landscape of our industry due to COVID and regulatory changes involving the amalgamation of the four voluntary industry ombud schemes, the kind of resilience demonstrated by Rihanna and the OBS team has remained a constant. They have embraced each challenge and the OBS board is satisfied that they have fulfilled their mandate. Secondly, the OBS's financial position remains healthy. We have a clean audit. We managed to end the year with a net operating surplus of exceeding a million rand, thus increasing retained earnings to just under eight million rand, due to intentionally building up reserves and managing the office's costs efficiently. The overall workload increased, but we are pleased to report that the turnaround times reduced due to additional resources and improved efficiency. For a second year in a row, there was no turnover of staff. As for the amalgamation of the OBS with the other three voluntary ombuds, the OBS board is keeping a close watch over this space, but overall we are satisfied that the time and effort spent on this project will be a positive outcome, which will benefit all the stakeholders. I want to commend Rihanna and her team for their outstanding performance on all fronts, from creating awareness of the services the OBS offers to the banking public, to successfully managing the staff and the finances of the OBS. I also want to thank our board for their commitment to this organisation. Finally, I want to thank our member banks for their financial support and in assisting us in resolving thousands of complaints. It remains a pleasure and a privilege to be part of the OBS team. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. At the OBS, we regard 2022 as a year of growth, transition, as well as a case of mission accomplished. Let me explain. Firstly, our themes. For 2022, we chose not just one theme, but three, wood, copper, and spinel. Wood symbolizes strength, growth, warmth, and durability. Copper for its user-friendly versatility, and it is a symbol for 22nd anniversary and the gemstone spinel for brightness, optimism and security. We believe that these three motives represent the office and our values and are threaded throughout the report visually and literally. For the OBS, as for South Africa and the world in general, 2022 was by no means a carbon copy of the previous two years. As COVID-19 gradually loosened its grip on the front page headlines on businesses and daily life in general, it became clear that many of us yearned for a return to business as usual. But some of the consequences of the pandemic lingered. For example, the hybrid way of work and more flexible hours became the new normal. The OBS's initiatives and adjustments in this regard, such as the four-day work week, reflect not only a break of the past, but could be seen as a trend-setting move. Coupling our HR initiatives with careful operational planning resulted in an improved performance on many levels. You will hear impressive statistics next and in the report you will read about how we managed to improve our turnaround times, how we dealt with a 16% increase in referrals, 14% increase in calls, how we achieved a record figure of more than 36 million for AVE, and at the same time our quality control increased to ensure that we deliver a quality service. On the regulatory front, we are pleased to report that in terms of the new regulations we successfully submitted our application for recognition to the Ombud Council. And on the amalgamation front, 2022 finally saw us going from speculation and contemplation into action. 
we spent countless hours planning and discussing the future plans with our counterparts from the short-term insurance ombudsman, the credit ombud and the long-term insurance ombudsman. And we were able to agree on principal and practical issues, culminating in the move to a joint single office for the three Johannesburg-based schemes. Our work in this regard is ongoing. Now for some more detail on our statistics, casework and consumer education and marketing efforts, I'm handing over to my colleagues. First up is Edrich Beitendorp with some statistics. Good day ladies and gentlemen. This year I'm not going to start with a quote about statistics, which is funny or inspiring, because let's face it, there is only one quote and I used it last year. But whether or not you find statistics as interesting as paint drying, the discipline of statistics does play a vital role in the lives of individuals and society. We live in an era of data, and the statistics is the science that offers us the tools to understand, analyze, and interpret data. It is the backbone of every informed decision and the foundation for the development of any scientific research. Statistics provide us with measurements, numerical data, and patterns that help us to understand human behavior, social demographics, and trends. Statistics, however, means nothing without providing meaning and context to them. At the OBS, statistics plays various roles. We use it internally as a management tool to monitor our progress and whether or not we are achieving the targets set at the beginning of each year. In this regard, it is also a useful tool to track employee performance and productivity and to ensure that all tasks are completed on time, specifically in these times where working from home has become the norm. The statistics are also used by our stakeholders to assess their complaints handling and trends. And lastly, we use it as a tool for feedback to our Board of Directors. Without further ado, I'm now going to hand you over to Lisbeth Mohachani from our offices to take you through the referral or premature matter statistics. Thanks, Edrich. Referrals are matters that are sent to the bank to afford the dispute resolution department 20 days to resolve the matter directly with the complainant. They are also called premature complaints. Should the matter not be resolved to the satisfaction of the complainant, or if our office does not receive the bank's response within the 20 days, the matter is then converted to a formal case. So let's have a look at a few of these premature case statistics. In 2022, we opened a total of 12,032 premature cases, an increase of 16% from 2021 and a staggering 43% from 2020. Of these premature matters opened, 25% were current account complaints, 13% were personal loans, and 10% were digital banking complaints. Another important statistic in the referral space is the conversion rate of premature cases to formal cases. This statistics gives us an indication of how many of these cases that were referred to the bank as premature cases are resolved and what the percentage was of cases that needed to be converted to a fully fledged formal case. A total of 5,702 cases were converted to formal matters. In 2023, three banks had a rate of over 50% of cases having to be converted to formal matters and two banks over 60%, which were NetBank at 64% and African Bank at 72%. Standard Bank, FNB and Discovery Bank had a low conversion rate compared to the number of referrals open per bank. I am now handing back to Edrich to go through the formal complaint statistics with you. Thanks, Lisbeth. In 2023, we opened a total of 7,869 formal cases, of which 5,702 were premature cases that needed to be opened as explained by Lisbeth. In total, this amounts to 5% fewer cases than in 2021. We closed 7,574 cases. Whilst our number of walking complainants keeps decreasing, the amount of calls received by our call centre increased by 14%. Every year, we feel the need to explain that the number of files open per bank is not necessarily indicative of the bank's complaint handling performance, or its performance in general for that matter. Banks vary considerably in size, client profile and product mix, and these factors all impact on the number of complaints made against the bank to the OBS. Overall, the total number of complaints increased from 7,720 in 2020 to 8,257 in 2021, but decreased slightly to 7,869 in 2022. 
Most banks saw an increase in formal cases opened, with net banking Capitec having the biggest increase. NetBank's formal cases increased by 18% and Capitex increased by 11% year on year. There has been a consistent trend in the increasing complaints against Capitec Bank in the past three years, which could be attributed to the rapid growth and high customer base of the bank. Standard Bank displayed the largest decrease in formal case openings. We opened 1,385 cases in 2022, compared to 2,070 in 2021 a decrease of 31%. Current account complaints increased further by 3%, making up a total of 22% of our complaints. Fraud in relation to the current account category makes up 65% of the category. Digital banking increased by 3% as well. The biggest subcategories of complaints in this regard are mobile banking fraud and vishing, which make up approximately 85% of all digital banking complaints. It would appear that the banks settle more of the credit card related matters, as our office opened 7% fewer of these cases in 2022. The trend of decreasing ATM complaints continues, as ATM complaints are down by another 3% year on year, as fewer and fewer people are using this banking product. The role of the banking ombudsman is to resolve banking complaints in a fair, independent and speedy manner. Our office found in favour of complainants in 23% of the cases, indicating once again that the most matters capable of early resolution were resolved by the banks, leaving our office to deal with the more complex matters. The 77% of cases in favour of banks is indicative of the fairness with which the banks and their internal dispute resolution departments treat complainants and their complaints, based of course on the 7,869 cases we handled. Complaints regarding the banks collecting on prescribed debts have increased year on year, in 2021, they made up 1.4% of all our complaints, while in 2022, they made up 4.5%. Estates and trust was a hot topic this year in the OBS offices. We received 257 complaints regarding delays in the finalisation of estates, compared to 120 the year before. This is an increase of 114% year on year. In 2021, we found in favour of complainants in 47% of these cases, while in 2022, we found in favour of complainants in 55% of these matters. The complaints were upheld fully in 12.1% of the cases, down from 15.9% in 2021. Cases that had no merit increased from 2021, and we could not uphold the complaints in 77.2% of the cases. 6.4% of matters where were we assisted the complainant in positively resolving their complaint, but without making a formal finding against the bank. The commitment to resolve banking complaints in a maximum of four months was positively upheld at a rate of 89%. Furthermore, approximately 98% of our complaints were finalized within six months from date of opening. We were able to close cases in an average of 67 days in 2022, a decrease of two days from 2021, mostly due to the increase in cases close between zero and 60 days. In 2022, there was a further decrease in the number of complainants who heard about the OBS through word of mouth, dropping to 30%. However, there was a significant increase in the number of complainants who learned about our office through search engines or Google, which rose to 18% as the OBS continues to increase its digital footprint. Complainants that learned of our office through social media increased by 3%. The percentage of complainants who learned about the OBS through radio, television, newspapers, exhibitions and magazines remained low. I'm now handing you back over to Lisbeth to present you with our demographics report for 2022. Thank you. The demographic report highlights the racial breakdown of our complainants, as well as the top categories of complainants lodged by them. A note of caution, not all of the complainants completed these questions as they are not compulsory. In 2022, 7,374 complainants opted to complete these sections of our application form. The ratio of male to female complainants increased by 1% in favour of females. The number of female complainants had steadily increased in the past couple of years. The biggest increase for female complainants in 2022 was in the credit card category. When looking at the provincial demographics, they provide useful information for our marketing efforts because they clearly indicate 
where consumer awareness should be focused. In 2022, Gauteng, as per usual, had the largest number of complaints with 47% of the total, 3% more than in 2021. This was followed by the Western Cape on 17% and KwaZulu-Natal on 13%. This is an indication that the largest number of complaints are still from the major metros in South Africa. In 2022, we had a total of 307 vulnerable consumers who complained to our office and were identified as such by our office. As an alternative dispute resolution body, we have a duty and an obligation to ensure appropriate mechanisms are in place to address the needs of vulnerable consumers when investigating complaints. A vulnerable consumer is defined as someone who is due to their personal circumstances, is especially susceptible to detriment, particularly when a firm is not acting with appropriate levels of care. 60% of our vulnerable consumers are classified as such due to their age at the time of logging the complaint, a decrease of 10%. The life events category increased by 11%, up from 22% of vulnerable consumers. Both subcategories of vulnerable consumers, namely death of a spouse or partner, 3% in 2021, and retrenchment, 17% in 2021, increased in 2022 to 11% and 20% respectively. The last slide sets out the top five subcategories of vulnerable consumers, where we break down the age ranges and life events into further age bands and categories. 29% fall within the ages of 65 to 75, while 26% fall within the ages of 75 to 85. Retrenchments make up 22% of all vulnerable consumers. This is up by 5% from 2021. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes the highlights of the statistics. All the statistics just mentioned and a few additional ones appear in the report, which will be available on our website. I am now handing over to Narosh and her team, who will take you through some interesting case studies. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Many of history's watershed moments, the printing press, the steam engine, and the internet, were only recognized as major changes in hindsight. But in banking, there has been a real-time recognition that the COVID-19 pandemic has irrevocably changed the industry. If 2020 and 2021 were the years that COVID forced banks to embrace change, 2022 was the year in which we saw that change institutionalized and the beginnings of a new normal emerge. In 2022, businesses had to deal with consumers' needs in a digitally charged world. It was the year that was coined the year of the B2H, business to human, where the customer experience trumped all else. To retain customers and to build long-lasting loyalties, banks in particular had a lot of boxes to tick. Interactions had to be personal and real-time all the time. Empowered customers are becoming more demanding on multiple dimensions, from service fees to sustainability, and new entrants are becoming more ambitious in their scope of services. Customers are looking for answers within the first few seconds of their search and the first five minutes of a query. Any lags are considered a failure on behalf of the business for not updating their deals, their inventory, or their content properly. For businesses to meet these expectations, they need to make sure that not only is their technology continuously providing and integrating real-time updates, but that they are acting on this information effectively. In the ombudsman space, we saw the consequences of the so-called new normal in the complaints that were lodged with our office and the renewed expectation of banking customers. It was a very busy year, as can be seen from our stats, and we dealt with a wide spectrum of complaints. I will now hand over to members of the adjudication team who will give you some insight as to the kind of complaints that were investigated in our space over the past year. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Emmanuel, and I am one of the adjudicators here at the OBS. It is no secret that one of the industries that was hardest hit by the global pandemic and the subsequent travel ban was the travel industry. Unfortunately, the ban resulted in scores of people being unable to make their pre-COVID pre-arranged travel plans. 
A lot of those travel bookings had either been paid in full or in part, and naturally those who had not received the services for which they had paid for wanted their money back. I certainly would. While the travel ban had inconvenienced many would-be travellers, it absolutely devastated the travel industry, and sadly it proved to be the death blow to several businesses within the industry. In one of the cases that our office dealt with, the customer made a booking through a travel company and made the payments by means of an immediate electronic fund transfer. The customer was unable to travel at the agreed to travel date due to the travel ban and had approached the bank to reverse the payments made for the now cancelled trip. Easy fix. The bank can just institute a chargeback for goods not delivered and problem solved, right? Unfortunately, this matter was not as straightforward as the disputed payment was an EFT directly made from the customer's bank account and there are no chargeback rights for card association rules like the Visa and MasterCard rules. Furthermore, in this case, the travel company had been placed under liquidation three weeks prior to the agreed to travel date. The bank responded to the customer's request that they were unable to submit the reversal request due to the payment being an immediate EFT payment and due to the travel company itself actually being liquidated. The bank thereafter directed the customer to the liquidator appointed to attend to the winding up of the travel company. From the evidence before us, we established that the customer had entered into a contractual relationship with the travel company and as such the payment was not made fraudulently to the travel company but rather in terms of an existing contractual relationship. Because the travel company had been placed in liquidation, even if the complainant had chargeback rights or the funds had been paid fraudulently, our office concluded that it would serve no purpose to submit a reversal request to the liquidator of the travel company as the liquidator would be legally prohibited from consenting to the refund. This is because the liquidator cannot allow the refund of the customer's payment whilst there are other customers in a similar position to the complainant who are not being reimbursed. Our office identified many complaints before us lodged by other complainants in similar positions involving the same travel company. Naturally, there wouldn't be enough funds to refund everybody because the travel company is now insolvent, which means that its liabilities exceed its assets. We therefore could not make a finding in the customer's favor. The principle from this case is that banks are not able to take responsibility to reimburse customers who have entered into a valid contractual relationship with the merchant when a dispute arises. In instances where merchants with whom the customer has a dispute against is under liquidation, the prescribed liquidation process must be adhered to and the customer will fall in as a concurrent creditor. Good day ladies and gentlemen, my name is Dereshka and I am one of the adjudicators on the team. The case I'm going to discuss centres around awards for distress and inconvenience suffered by banking customers and how these awards are considered and recommended by this office. In this instance, the complainant was approved a building loan by the bank in the region of 2 million rand. The interest rate granted was prime minus 0.5%. The customer accepted the offer and proceeded to commence with his building project. Five months later, the complainant approached the bank for his first withdrawal from the loan facility. He was shocked and confused when he was informed by the bank that there was in fact no such facility in place. Upon investigation, the bank confirmed that the consultant had misinterpreted an email received from the complainant at the time of acceptance and proceeded to withdraw the loan application. No communication was sent to the complainant to inform him that the application had been withdrawn. He was completely unaware that there was no facility in place. The building had commenced and the complainant was now without funds to pay his contractors and to continue the project. Stranded without funds, he was forced to reapply at the bank for a new building loan. The new application was approved, however, on less favourable terms. He was granted a lower loan amount with a difference of approximately 900,000 Rand from the initial loan amount offered. He was also offered a higher interest rate. The bank submitted that the reduced offer was due to the complainant's affordability. Through our investigation, we noted that whilst the error by the bank in withdrawing the initial loan application may have been bona fide, the facts of the matter confirmed that severe distress and inconvenience was suffered by the customer as a result of the bank's actions. 
In this instance, the complainant was prejudiced by a lower loan amount and higher interest rate. His building project was placed on hold due to lack of funds, which also tainted his relationship with his contractors. Had the bank communicated with the complainant at the time that the application was withdrawn, the issue could have been avoided. We could not force the bank to reinstate the original offer, neither could we force the bank to make an offer on the original terms, as it was not disputed that the complainant's affordability did change during the five months. We however considered the distress and inconvenience suffered by the complainant and made an award of 50,000 Rand against the bank for the distress and inconvenience suffered. The bank accepted our recommendation. It is important to note that 50,000 Rand is the maximum award for distress and inconvenience that can be made by our office, which is in accordance with our terms of reference. Complainants, however, are still with recourse to approach a court of law for any other general damages and consequential loss that they may have suffered. This case highlights that in instances where a bank's error caused a customer distress and inconvenience, an award for distress and inconvenience should be considered by a bank after it considers the facts of the matter and the consequences suffered by the customer. The award is recommended to make amends for its error and this is in line with what is envisaged by the conduct standards for banks. Good morning to all. During the past reporting period, our office has received quite a few complaints and our inquiries regarding the various interest-free periods offered by banks in respect of transactions concluded on credit card accounts. In all of these instances, the complainants disputed the interest charged to their credit card accounts held with the banks. In one specific case, the complainant also submitted that the bank created a false impression with regards to this 57-day interest-free period on a credit card account. It should be mentioned that the 57-day period is not a standard time frame and as such this may vary from bank to bank. The issue considered by our office was the exact workings of the interest-free period and the specific dates involved therein. The complainant submitted to the bank that she had settled the full outstanding balance due and payable on a credit card account within the 57-day interest-free period and as such that the bank was fraudulently charging interest on a credit card account. As per the response from the bank, a credit card customer has 27 days from the credit card statement date to settle the full outstanding balance on a credit card account in order to benefit from the interest-free period. The length of the interest fee period will accordingly depend on the date of each transaction being processed to the credit card account, which will accordingly vary between 27 and 57 days. As stated previously, this specified time frame may vary from bank to bank. The evidence placed before office indicated that the bank had informed the complainant through the terms and conditions of the credit card agreement that if the full outstanding balance is not settled on or before the payment date as contained in the monthly account statements, interest will be charged from the date of each transaction. As per the statements of the credit card account provided to the complainant by the bank, it is stated that the interest-free period is calculated from the day following the first date as per the relevant statement period to the payment date as contained in a specific statement. In this specific instance, the complainant had not settled the full outstanding balance due and payable on the credit card account on or before the due dates as indicated in the credit card statements provided by the bank and as such the bank charged interest to the credit card account. Our office also considered whether the promotional material of the bank relating to the 50-day interest-free period is false or misleading. As per the promotional material, it is clearly stated that a customer will benefit from up to 57 interest-free days. Our office found that the representation from the bank is not false or misleading as a customer is able to get up to 57 interest-free days in respect of transactions concluded on a credit card account, depending on the date of the transactions being concluded. Should a transaction be concluded on the start date of a specific credit card statement period, then you will be afforded the full interest-free period, which will run until the payment due date as reflected on the specific credit card statement. It therefore follows that should the full outstanding balance due and payable on a credit card account not be settled on or before the due date as indicated in a credit card statement, Interest is calculated by the bank on the outstanding balance of the credit card account on a daily basis and charged monthly in arrears. It is therefore evident that the 57-day interest-free period on the credit card account 
is not calculated from the date of each individual transaction, but from the dates as specified in a credit card statement. Our office could therefore not make a finding in the complainant's favour. The lesson to be learned from these types of complaints is that the bank customer should not make assumptions in respect of promotional material supplied by the bank without carefully reading the terms and conditions prior to entering into a credit agreement with the bank. Thank you, Emmanuel Durishkan Harit, for those insights. For a more detailed account of the complaints investigated by our office in 2022, please consult our annual report. You will find that it makes for very interesting reading. We have come to realize that it is time for a different approach. With the emergence of a new normal in the banking industry, the customer experience remains integral to any bank remaining a key player in a highly competitive market. There is much to gain in ensuring empathy and understanding in the banker-customer relationship. It will mean learning to better understand and respond to customers' financial situations and needs. The modern approach to banking places a greater responsibility on the individual bank official, making it necessary for them to have a sound working knowledge of the general principles of the law of contract. Banking customers, on the other hand, have their role to play in ensuring that they adhere to their responsibilities and obligations. Just to mention a few, they have a contractual obligation to ensure that their information is up to date, to ensure that their confidential banking information is not shared with third parties, and to ensure that they read a document and fully understand the contents before signing. It would be safe to say that each party has an obligation to make sure that they keep their end of the bargain. On a final note, we would like to take the opportunity to thank the adjudication team for their hard work, passion and dedication. Your contribution to another successful year in dispute resolution is very much appreciated. Thank you. Good day everyone. My name is Gwanda Vabaza and I'm the OBS's Communications Manager. By now, it should be obvious to everyone here that as the Ombudsman for Banking Services, we want not only to be known, but also seen as the best dispute resolution body within the banking space. This is what we are striving for as the OBS's Communications Department. In 2022, we exceeded our goals by ensuring high visibility through our press releases and other articles that were published on various traditional and online media platforms. Through our partnerships with our stakeholders, which are too many to mention, we participated in various face-to-face -face engagements hosted in provinces spread across South Africa. We also believe that through our press release on prescription, we not only maintained high visibility within the South African banking community, but also we made a noticeable and lasting impact within the banking sector. Many people got to hear and understand what a prescribed debt is, leading to many complaints being lodged with the office, and in some instances, people's debts were written off. We are also confident that the press release also had the desired effect of ensuring that the banks review their debt collection policies and procedures to ensure that they do not collect on prescribed debts going forward. Through our media engagements, we obtained a record-breaking advertising value equivalency of over 36 million rands, which was a 27% increase from 2021. Our social media platforms also continue to see a steady but noticeable increase in the number of followers. On the corporate social responsibility front, our staff did not disappoint. In recognition of Mandela Day, each member contributed clothing and non-perishable items which we donated to an orphanage in the East Rand called Fountain of Love as well as to a squatter camp located in Wastorp and the National Freedom Network, which is an NPO that rescues and assists victims of human trafficking. Lastly, we hosted our 21st Annual Excellence Awards, which were emceed by the funny doctor himself, Dr. Riyad Musa, who administered his dose of medicine through laughter and had all of us in stitches. On the day, Recognition for excellence within the dispute resolution space was given to deserving winning banks and individuals. Superhost herself, Ms. Rihanna Stein, congratulated Capital Bank and Discovery Bank as the big winners on the day. 
Mr. Shalen Rampiar of Standard Bank and Ms. Aisha Lahe of Investec were also celebrated for their individual awards received in recognition of the hard work and the fairness they displayed in their quest to resolve and disputes amicably. A special award was awarded to FNB's designated officer, Mr. Brett Erasmus, for his commitment to customer care and for ensuring that all complainants were treated fairly. The last award of the day went to Mr. Wandile Shabangu for being the employee who best represented the values and the internal culture of the OBS during 2022, as voted for by the OBS staff. In conclusion, I hope that you will all agree with us when we say that 2022 was a good year for the OBS as well as the South African banking public who were fortunate enough to receive and benefit from the free service we offer. Thank you. In closing, we trust that everyone have enjoyed our summary of the report. As you may know, we have moved to our new wood-finished offices in Rosebank, a change in anticipation of the various ombud schemes amalgamation. The trepidation felt by people during any major change such as this will soon be replaced by the practicalities and excitement of our transformation into a single powerful entity. We look forward to our role in this new chapter in service of the South African banking industry as well as the bigger financial services industry and its customers. May we all grow from strength to strength. Thank you to everyone and every staff member of the OBS who worked very hard behind the scenes to produce the work that we were able to showcase here today and which you will read about in the report. Thank you to our Board of Directors for your guidance and support. And finally, to you, our stakeholders, for upholding your end of the bargain in order to make our work possible. We hope to see you all again next year. Thank you.